Hi, Molly. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. It's uh, in this big pleasure to interview you uh, mm -hmm. on my um, on my blog. And the first question is uh, for you: what is um, what is a uh, good musical composition like? Hmm, it's a tough question. <laughs> um, I think for me personally, is one that just keeps my attention. I would say, and also. Um, takes me in unexpected places, or at least with my own music, I try to um, not maybe constantly surprise the listener, I think, but have a form that maybe ends up where you were, would have not expected at the beginning of the piece. And um, maybe what is uh, your musical ideas or ideas or that you more frequently use or, or, or you come back when you compose? Or yeah, maybe think, what's your musical like, signature? Oh, uh, um, it definitely varies with each piece. I would say I'm definitely um, very influenced by um, like kind of more minimalist styles or minimalist composers, post minimalists, and so forth. So I think a lot of my music has, I would say, like a constant pulse or a lot of repeated figures. Um, I think more on a whatever kind of instrumental level, technical level, a lot of my music involves electronics, um, lots of like reverb, so forth. And I also perform a lot on this toy organ instrument. Um, so I think that's a kind of critical part of my style, if you will, like the toy organ sound and processing that. Um, but I think it also informs my writing for other groups, like, um, like learning from the organ, like such as it has these chord buttons on the left-hand side, which have, um, I believe it's six major and six minor chords so it's not fully chromatic so i really like playing around with those chord progressions which i think kind of feeds itself into other pieces um, along with i love like cluster chords in the organ or the sound of that which i think really comes into my own my other music as well mm, i have uh, in your website uh my songs that uh, your let's say your musical pitch right as composer is that you you somehow put uh, disability in the center of your of your mm -hmm. compositional practice. Can you explain it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I identify as disabled, or I was involved in a car accident um, a little more than 20 years ago, in which my left hand was nearly amputated. And um, since the accident, it's really been a journey from denying my disability to embracing it first and foremost. Um, and I think this journey or eventual like kind of unfolding almost of my disability or embracing it has really paralleled the progression of my artistic practice um, from one um, is very much like trained in music composition that was really my focus for a while or just composing for others um, to further realms involving like performance collaboration and even more like um, communal engagement or high highlighting voices of other disabled people um, and for me it's just the more and more I learn about disability the more um, I just it's like this infinite creative source for me you know just there's always more to explore and improve on either with just reckoning with disability in society overall or that the social construction of it um, or also to realms of accessibility um, such as exploring and for me that really means like exploring multiple sensory outputs of my material to hopefully be as accessible um, and equitable to as many audiences as possible. Can you give some examples? Uh, sure, for accessibility, I mean, for me, it initially started with, I just started performing with like videos of my work, like when I do solo performances, especially that had open captions of the lyrics I was singing, um, which is hopefully, I mean, helpful to all audiences, but especially deaf and hard of hearing audiences, and then has expanded, especially in my more collaborative work to including um, audio description, which usually describes visual movements for um, blind and low vision users, um, or usually just a kind of audio description users in general, um, and like sign language interpretation, um, which I've done in video and live performance. Um, some of my dreams are to have more tactile and haptic like outputs of the music, like really vibrational um, objects or technology and so forth, um, which I think is, has this interesting cross section with deaf and hard of hearing users and blind and low vision users, really all users in a way. Um, and again, for me, I just love exploring how to creatively involve that, um, especially because these facets are especially like captioning or sign language inter interpretation are usually viewed as like add-ons in a yes. say a presentation or artistic work. And I love trying to just that challenge of trying to artistically integrate it 
Um, so it's really an essential part of the artwork. And uh, uh, do you collaborate with uh, disabled performers as well? Uh, yeah, quite often. I would say my most frequent um, collaborator that you know is disabled is the dancer Jaron Herman. We've done about um, four or five works together now. Um, we both have impaired left sides through different sources. So mine um, like acquired through my car accident and him congenital um, from cerebral palsy. So he's born with his disability. Um, so we love exploring that kind of shared terrain yet through different sources in our work. Um, and we've done everything from more just video focus work to live performance, even taking video to live performance, kind of everything in between. Um, and we often try to involve other collaborators with yes. our work now. Mm -hmm. And um, um, composing, uh, using this approach, right? What it, uh, <laughs> what this, uh, what, what's the main thing? What uh, maybe your other uh, colleagues learn from you or, or you think you, you want to say to them uh, what uh, what this disability right brings to 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 the music field yeah that's a good question um i think so much i think or i almost want to get back to you in a week or something or i need to think about it a little further i think one thing that stands out for me is um i feel like a lot of music performance um is like tied around like visual impression or say if someone performs something very fast or something, you know, it's like this. And for me that ties with this idea of virtuosity and this almost like Olympian like embrace the virtuosity is very fast, again, visually impressive. And for me, you know, a lot of my current research looks at virtuosity and disability in that intersection. Um, and for me, that's trying to get away from this kind of normative, almost in my view, like ableist idea of virtuosity and bring it to other realms and really open it up to everyone. Um, so that's one thing that stands out to me now. Um, and also I think disability, like aesthetics and accessibility overall just naturally really involve, again, these kind of different sensory outputs or kind of multimedia outputs, um, which I think you know, for people that want to do more multimedia or multidisciplinary work, it kind of works hand in hand sometimes. Are you considered a multimedia composer? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, like to, I feel like composers never like to label themselves, you know. Um, I do do a lot of my own, like I would say, video editing, etc., especially for creating captions. Um, so I love having at least the facility to, the, to do that. I'm not probably the greatest editor, but um, but it's really, I, I love, especially for my own solo performances, performing with video just to have that option. So are you making uh, a video on your own, right? For your, for your yeah, video? Like a, yeah, I, sometimes it varies based on the piece. Like if it's only captions or text, I usually just make that my own. But a lot of times I collaborate with filmmakers for videoing it and then I'll edit it or they do all the editing. There's varying ranges of collaboration. And what's the difference uh, when you make like, let's say sound only piece, mm -hmm. right? And when you make multimedia piece, what's, mm -hmm. um, what it make, uh, what kind of different uh, per uh, perspective it, it asks from mm -hmm. composer? Yeah, I think like, obviously, I mean, I really like working with other videographers and getting their perspective on, you know, the filming, but also the editing different shots to incorporate, because I think I'm always like, I feel like I kind of just learned editing on my own as much as I did learn it. Um, I think it's interesting as the composer and then editing your own video, you can get really locked into the music, I think in a good way, because you know, different musical cues in a way if that makes sense too, or different chord changes, for example. Um, and sometimes when I edit my own videos, I try to have that the form of the editing like evolve with the musical form as well, such as only sh showing certain shots for a while and then expanding to different shots, if that makes sense. Um, but I feel like I'm always um, learning in that aspect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, what triggered you to start uh, to, uh, to start creating the multimedia pieces or multisensory mm -hmm. pieces? What was the trigger for you? Uh, yeah, I think it was a gradual evolution. Well, 
I think I had started doing music videos for um, like other works of mine that I wasn't performing in or solo works, um, especially I, I've worked a lot with the Philadelphia based um, company 410 Media, and I'd always love their music videos. Um, so whenever I had a solo piece that I liked and the performer was willing to, we made a kind of music video from that. So I love working with them and I think learning from them and just the emphasis on how it's really nice to have a video product out there of a piece in general. Um, and then I guess one of the first ones was I made a video with um, this visual artist, Maya Smira, and we were at a residency together in China and she shot it of my hands and then I edited it. Um, and I guess, sorry to get back to your original question, I think the initial impetus too for me, especially as a solo performer, um, was because I felt like it's only me on stage or something and I'm performing on this toy organ instrument and it's all about my hands, like the songs I'm singing and I felt like the audience, it's really hard unless they're sitting like literally right next to me, I think to really see what's going on. I used to even perform like straight out to the audience and I switched it more to a profile view so they can at least see a little more of the hands. Um, and I felt like the video makes it much more complete, even if I'm not talking about, you know, accessibility for disability, but it may, I can get those really up close and intimate views of disability and especially my hand and scars, et cetera, that I think one often doesn't get. Um, and especially with a performance combined with the songs I'm singing. Um, and then also on all the videos, I add like open captions of the lyrics, um, which I really love doing just for hopefully you know, one can understand more what I'm singing about, um, especially because even if you are a native English speaker, say I often perform with a lot of reverb. I think it's not often super clear, like my diction. So I think the open caption lyrics hopefully help with that. Um, and again, just hopefully make the performance a little more complete. Got it, got it, got it. And what kind of um, technological artifacts you, you use most frequently, I don't know, softwares or hardwares Oh, um, hardware, I would say, obviously, like my toy organ instrument, kind of, and then just like an audio interface mic. It's pretty simple. I've started performing more with a musical glove. Um, it's like a MIDI controller mm -hmm. um, to kind of get away from my organ a little bit or be a little more portable. And I also just bought like a music sensor, which is made by Mari Kimura, um, which senses like movement, basically, which I want to attach to my left hand and make music through that. That's very much in the early stages. And then software, again, pretty straightforward. I'd say I use like a lot of Sibelius notation software, Logic as my digital audio workstation. Um, I'm starting to work more in Max now with like live programming. I think that's the main. And then of Adobe Premiere for video editing. And do you call this well? Do I what, sir? Do you code? Do you, uh, oh, do you code. Uh, no, no, not at this point. <laughs> and um, how your music changed in the last 10 years, right? Oh, um, it's hard to, yeah, to think back 10 years ago. Um, I mean, it definitely involved a lot more electronics. I mean, I think I probably started getting involved in electronics about 10 years ago, but probably the most significant progression was me performing. Um, in my own music, like with the organ and my voice, like starting to sing as well um, in the collaborations I've done. And also it's even like I have a recent project that's a disability interview project that features voices of disabled interviewees. Um, so involving like spoken text in my music like that. Um, so. <laughs> and um, how you and how you compose, right? Uh, so how you start and and what kind of stages you go through. Mm. Yeah, it really varies on the piece, I think, you know, based on the, just whatever um, the task at hand kind of, or the commission and who I'm writing for. Um, I often try to, a lot of my pieces are kind of fueled by binary forms, I kind of call them. So like, they'll have like two kind of goalposts, if you will, like I want the range to go high to low or the texture to go thin to thick or something. Um, which I feel like just helps guide me in the writing process um, without being too prescriptive, like, oh, I want this to happen at three minutes in or something. Uh, and I really like doing that because, again, it just really helps guide me when I'm writing without feeling like I'm making, you know, to have an end point in mind or where I want the piece to go. And I think my interest in binary forms kind of comes from my, my immediate experience with kind of binaries with my left, my hands, like with something very similar yet very different from each mm -hmm. other. Um, so that's often a big motivator with my pieces. 
Um, and then it just really varies again, I would say based on the project. And of course, sometimes I work with writers and have texts beforehand. So that very much informs the music. Um, yeah, just really depends. Um, if you were a man, would your music would be different? If I was what? So, oh, a man. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. To be honest, or I've never really thought about that. Or, um, it might, I mean, I feel like I'm a very sensitive person, um, maybe as a female as well. So maybe it wouldn't have the same sensitivity or, but um, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. If uh, this accident would happen, would your music would be different? Uh, I'm sure. I think I might not, not have even gone into composition, maybe, or because I um, before the accident, I was playing like a little bit of violin. And then after the accident, played cello and trumpet. And I don't think I was naturally gifted on any of those instruments or meant to really pursue a career in them. But I think I was really drawn to composition that I didn't have to think because with cello and trumpet, I had still some issues with my hand because my left hand is weaker and holding those instruments and so forth. Um, and so I think with composition, since it was like all mostly on the computer, I felt like I could just, I was younger at the time, but could really let my mind and imagination run free. Like when I look back, like I didn't have to think about my hands at all. Um, so I think that's why I really gravitated towards it at the time, even though of course now it's kind of taken a 180 in disabilities very much. Like I think about it all the time with my practice or engaging it. But um, so I think it really, yeah, led me to that back then. And um, what do you fear as composer? Fear? Um, not too, this might seem a little material. I think just trying to get your music out there, basically. Um, this might be seem too career oriented, but I think just because you, you work so hard on these projects and you just, you know, you hope to share them as much as possible. And why you compose? Um, to me, it's kind of, I always say like the easiest and hardest thing I know how to do. Like it always feels like the most natural um, or thing that gives me so, so much joy, but also it's, sometimes it's the most annoying thing to do or I don't want to do it a lot. You know, it's the most challenging. It's constantly challenging me in a good way. And I also feel like I'm kind of addicted to it. Like I know if I take a few days off or whatnot or take a vacation, which is definitely fine, but I'm always kind of ready to get back to work or something feels like and me not right, or I, I kind of like going back to it. Good. Mm -hmm. And um, looking uh, on uh, on not particularly on you, no, on on your music, right? But uh, how how in general, uh, what are how new music in the United States change uh, during this century? Uh, what I think, or yes, what yes. Uh, what you <laughs> Um, I think it's definitely become, I mean, I'm a little younger, or you know, I wasn't as active during the beginning, you know, the century, say, but uh, I think it's definitely become more equitable and diverse in a good way. Um, I think there's just a lot greater representation of, of different voices and identities. Um, of course, in my biased view, I'd like to see that extend more towards disabled voices and composers. Um, um, but yeah, that's what I think so far. And how audience change? Um, I think I have to think, sorry, it seems a little, cause I haven't been to a ton of concerts with COVID. Um, but I think hopefully they, it seems like, um, people are more or open, I think, and receptive to new music. Um, and especially the intersection of new music, you know, with other disciplines. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, where do you see where is this uh, new music right uh, scene in the United States where it's heading are there some trajectory where it, where it goes or, or are there some trains or... I don't think I could say probably <laughs> I mean I do think um, I guess I mean it's interesting with COVID too you know I think because people, a lot of people are going back to live performance which is great I mean be curious with I think some of the most interesting output from composers is on albums, you know, viewing it as like an album project or um, one of the, the co-directors of the new Amsterdam record label, Judd Greenstein, says like the album is the new symphony, which I love that saying or something. And 
Um, so I guess that's, I feel like maybe a strong movement towards that or composers looking to, you know, make an album as kind of their statement, if you will. And I'd be curious if that continues or advances. I think I was hoping that more emphasis on that would come for funding, grant makers, et cetera, with COVID, like it's obviously an album's a more digital project these days. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question or something, but I think more just like practically on people thinking about mm -hmm. really the medium for their output as well. Yes, got it. And uh, what is the um, role of new music in United States society? Um, I think, I mean, I think just obviously just really highlighting um, the voices and viewpoints from living musicians and of course composers today really living in the world we are and reflecting upon it. And um, I think it can, and also in my view too, like highlighting that of marginalized identities as well. Um, and uh, last question, what would be your free suggestions to younger composers? Yeah. <laughs> We, um, I'd say the first one, I always say perseverance. I think just especially out of school, like it's um, it's just so important. I just think it's it's hard when someone's maybe not always pushing you like a teacher or something. And so I think just to really view it as a marathon, not a sprint or something like your own practice. Um, I'd say too, I once read in this book, The Daily Creative, like the, um, I don't know, the treasure of making secret work, which I really like that idea, or making work for yourself that's maybe, say, not commissioned or not for anyone else. Doesn't mean you cannot ever use that material for other purposes. Um, but I think just really kind of tapping back into that joy of why you started composing in, in the start, because I think it's very easy to get caught up in the, the business of it all or the stress of it all, you know, and to try to tap back into that. Um, and I would say three, uh, my... Former like teacher and mentor Missy Mazzoli always says, um, "Have a life, not a career," which I love, um, just because I think it's easy to. And I feel like I try to say this to myself all the time too. It's easy to get caught up in just career oriented, I would say, decisions or you know, or focuses um, rather than life oriented. Uh, thank you very much. Uh... Thank you. <laughs>